Is this you finishing your 7 hour speedrun and feeling like it's just not long enough? Then I have the thing for you. The Xenoblade Trilogy speedrun. 6 games, 1 speedrun, lasting about a day and with no sleep. Hello everyone, I'm Shamcat and I love Xenoblade Chronicles. So much so in fact that I did one of the craziest speedruns in the series' history. This run involved beating all 3 numbered games, as well as their additional story content. Future Connected, Future Redeemed, and Torn of the Golden Country, all in one sitting. Now of course this is a monumental task that you need to be prepared for, so I dedicated the months before the run to honing my skills across all the games by using a massive spreadsheet which included the notes and strats of some of the best runners across the series. Without the help of them and many other fantastic runners, this challenge would have been impossible to even start. This speedrun is pretty simple in concept, but actually being able to execute in so many different games and to play through the exhaustion was certainly a challenge as this run will show. But rather than waffling here, it's time to actually talk about my run. This is the run to prove you can beat the Xenoblade Chronicles trilogy in less than a day. Since this felt like the most logical way to go through this run, I started off by playing the first game in the series. Xenoblade Chronicles, but Definitive Edition because I don't actually own the Wii version. The objective of this run is to get through all 17 chapters as fast as possible, on casual mode so we don't have to XP grind, and on version 1.1.2, which gets rid of some glitches, but keeps others. I started the first few chapters with some pretty mediocre RNG. Alongside a few mistakes, and by the time I had beaten the Bizarre Gardens, I was roughly a minute behind this custom comparison I was using. Since comparing against my PBs would be far too difficult, and comparing against nothing wouldn't be very interesting, for most of my run, I ran against a custom comparison, where the times were decided by maths and spreadsheets. These were usually quite a ways off my real PB. For example, my time to beat in Xenoblade 1 was a 4.54, much slower than my real PB of 4.41. Whilst being behind the custom comparison was pretty bad, it wouldn't be a very big deal as so long as the very next thing went well. But upcoming was one of the most major RNG barriers in the series, known on my splits as the Gogol Gacha. These Gogols around Regwell Lake contain some very valuable loot for this stage in the game, given there are about 60 levels above us. Naturally, in a normal fight, we'd basically get one shot, but if we're clever, we can use the terrain to our advantage. By getting them aggroed onto Shulk, we can move them around in such a way to where the ape is right by the edge. With a well spaced Monado Buster, we can push them off plummeting into the lake and dropping a chest, since Buster has a very slight knockback effect. Roughly 45% of the time, you'll miss the attack, and even if the hit wants to connect, you can still get blocked, making the odds of a hit actually connecting around 1 in 3, so after going through a block and 2 misses, I got the knockback sending him down. Brown chest. Reload the file. On top of needing a 1 in 3 chance to get the hit, we need another roughly 1 in 3 chance to get a silver or gold chest so we can get the item we want. So on average, you'd expect 9 rotations of the push to try and get the chest we need. But for this run, it took a grand total of 31 attempts. Even if we discount the 9 I lost to getting hit early, this bad luck is still ridiculous, with it giving me a silver chest on my 9th successful push. 97% of runs would have better odds than that. After getting this chest we save, and go through them until we get a good item. Thankfully I only took one attempt to get the item I needed, an Empire Pike, but the damage had already been done, with me suffering a 13 minute time loss, less than one hour into the run. I guess we should discuss the equipment we're using a little bit as well. On Shulk we've got as much quick step as we can fit, this gem increases his running speed, both inside and out of combat, and as we have to walk from place to place, this is incredibly valuable. On Ryan we can equip the brand new Empire Pike, which is a very strong weapon which will allow him to carry our damage. Sharla is also here. In order to get any other options in terms of party members, we need to get to chapter 6. And to get to chapter 6, we need to get through the ether mines. To get through this section as fast as possible, we need to perform a vision at the exact time we land on the ground in order to cancel our full damage. This requires quite a precise setup, where we give Sharla just the right amount of armor to trigger our visions, Turn it up to normal mode briefly and get Shulk in the right position so that our vision goes off just as he makes contact with the ground. Even when taking a few times trying to get the enemies to cooperate, this is still a multiple minute time save over not doing the skip. Once we've gotten past this, we add Dunban to the party, and from here our squad is pretty much complete, with Shulk, Dunban and Ryan all giving a ton of damage. 
Now a lot of the fight strategies involve hitting our positional arts to fell up a party meter, lowering some physical defense with Slut Edge, and then going into a chain attack. Slut Edge again, Wardly Slash, and then Sword Drive to hopefully get a very substantial chunk out of their health bar. We can do this for the next 10 or so chapters, using the occasional topple lock strategy for some scary bosses, where we keep on spamming topple and daze arts before the topple timer has worn off. That is, until we get to Lorathea. We actually go into this fight as Dunban, and put Shulk onto the third slot to give him an extra powerful Monado Cyclone in the chain attack, getting rid of all of our adds. This is because every time you use an art with the same colour on its chain, the damage will be increased for each subsequent art. Now it's just Lorathea, she cannot overwhelm us too easily, making the rest of the fight pretty straightforward. What's not straightforward though is what we do next, the glitch known as Party Swap. One of the additional features of Definitive Edition was adding a time attack mode, which we can use to completely bug out the endgame of the speedrun and trivialise all the fights. But we'll also bug out your save file permanently, so don't go trying it on any casual files. But with that said, here's how you do it. Walk back to Colony 9 to start Collection Quest 1, trade a pricey item with Rocco to get a bonus rabbit diode, go into the Land of Challenge, talk to the Arch Sage to do the Shaggy Dog Story Challenge, talk to the Arch Sage again but buy a rabbit diode, then go into the He of the Metal Face Restricted Challenge. Wait on this screen for 10 seconds, put Charlotte to level 10, swap to her, and kill ourselves. Now, if all that's done correctly, we respawn outside of the Gem Man's stool as these restricted party members, Ricky, Charlotte, and Dunban, who are all at level 90. So from here, we can play the rest of the game as this team and destroy everything in our path. This includes the game's final boss, Zanza, who we take down, finishing the run at 5 hours, 1 minute, and 17 seconds. And then we quickly fast forward one year into the world of Xenoblade Chronicles Future Connected. As it is the extra chunk of story content for the base game, Future Connected plays pretty similarly speedrun wise as we spend the whole game controlling Shulk, using his powerful physical arts and Monado arts to finish fights quickly. However, since we don't have the real Ryan, we have to use basically Ryan aka Nene, and we don't have Dunban, so we gotta use Melia in his place, who does damage with ether attacks rather than physical ones. Another change in Future Connected combat is the removal of chain attacks, in favour of Union Strikes, where we have to hit a few quick time events to deal some damage to the enemies. The last one in the sequence has a 2 frame window to time by the way. We also don't have a time attack mode to do the party swap glitch with, so we have to do the final fights still as our normal party, a fact which isn't great for us. The final boss for Future Connected is this dude, the Fog King, who is, in my opinion, the most difficult final boss in the series and this is just when playing in casual mode. It does not take long for him and his guards to kill a party member if you get unlucky, and if that happens it will be very hard to recover the fight, unless you basically won anyway. So the solution may be a Monado armor, to reduce damage taken significantly for a while, but he can just chuck out an erasing mist and get rid of all your buffs. In the first phase, Melia got knocked down, and from there, Nene and Shulk quickly fell, sending us back to the start. This cost me about three and a half minutes, but I was able to get a pretty good fight on my second attempt, finishing Future Connected in 38 minutes and 22 seconds. Out of all the games in the series, Xenoblade 2 is my favourite in both a casual and speedrun sense, and this is the game I also have the most experience in, having held world record in any percent DLC normal, the category I was just starting. Now in Xenoblade 2, the easy mode categories are a bit of a meme, so we therefore play in normal mode, but the DLC versus no DLC distinction is a little more important. On top of challenge mode and the torn side story, that we will be talking about very soon, the Xenoblade 2 DLC also adds a bunch of helpful items and expands the already large roster of blades. This makes the run faster and more consistent, so for the purposes of this run, we will be playing with the DLC, especially since if we're playing Torna, we have it anyway. We can pick up both Corvin and Crosette's Core Crystals in Chapter 2 with a little detour. Corvin is the first to be awakened and onto Rex, where he's more of a support blade, offering strong defenses and damage, but not being the main blade we use. That accolade goes to Crosette, the queen of this category. Whilst the Bitball is a pretty weak class overall, Crosette can give herself a damage increase of up to 500% with her skill Gathering Sparks, which increases damage every time you grab a potion. On Nia, she's able to make great use of this with the potion art Dolphin Spin, 
She can also use Acrobatic Bomber, a powerful break art, so the team can use fusion combos at the right time, and a pure healing art to make sure no one gets too low on health. With the power of these blades, I breezed through the first three chapters, finishing off with a beautiful push on both Malos and Akos, finishing less than 30 seconds behind my incredibly optimized PB. However, what was coming up next was pure RNG. The blade pulls. It's no secret that field skills in Xenoblade 2 suck, with there being a variety of barriers that we can't actually get past, unless we've already pulled some blades. To be exact, in this run, we absolutely need three Earth Blades, two Fire Blades, and one Wind Blade, but we also need a Water Blade for some fights, preferably with a good weapon like a Lance or Katana. In decent time, we got all the blades that were absolutely required, and even got Perun for good measure, who was Ancient Wisdom, which will save us about a minute later on. However, there was someone who seemed to be missing from the polls. Yup, Boreas. This meant we had to spend just under two minutes going back and forth speaking with Nothons in order to unlock a skill on Poppy's chart so that we could progress past Chapter 4. Since we started Chapter 4 with this huge time loss, we had to spend the next half an hour or so playing around that until we made it to the Patroka and Mikar fight at the end. The objective of this fight is to put a Water Blade onto Rex and use the Steam Explosion combo to get them both at once. Positioning is always difficult here, and I couldn't quite get Petroka in the blast, although it was not far off, and so I had to take her down individually as well. Because of this mistake and others in my chapter 4, I was no longer playing near my PB, but was still on good pace for an XE2 time in this marathon. For the rest of this run, I was playing on pretty solid form, even getting my fastest ever Phantasm fight, one of the hardest in the whole game. This run was definitely looking on pace for a sub 4, which is an impressive time to get on its own. However, there were still two more main barriers in my way. This random door, and the final boss, Artifice Ion. This door seems unassuming, but you need to have a bunch of both Focus and Electric Mastery to complete the associated field skill check, which we skip over for the purposes of speed, and so we can just jump through. But this clip is one of the hardest in the series, practically just feeling like luck at times. It took me about two minutes to break through, an unfortunate time loss to see so late into the run. Throughout the run, breaks always give a nice little bit of extra damage, but are never quite necessary, outside of a few examples. That is, until we get to Ion. The first phase is pretty easy, but the second needs a fusion combo so that we can get a kill in a chain attack. Out of the three breaks I can go for in this fight, the first one isn't needed, but either of the last two mean we win. Alternatively, Ion also has the uh, X star, which he'll use about 1 in every 10 runs, where he'll instead only give one chance to break since he's immune to breaks during the duration of the art. This is what happened here, and we spiralled out of control in this fight. Whilst I was on pace for a 3.58 if I got a break, I had to spend 4 minutes fist fighting Ion, leading to a Xenoblade 2 time of 4.02. I couldn't let that bother me too much though, as it was now time to move on to Torna the Golden Country. Writing this script, it's been a good few months since I finished this run, but if you ask me even in Torna's final boss, what happened Chem? You're like 20 minutes behind BB. I wouldn't have been able to tell you. Much like in the base game, I'd held world record in Torna before, and currently sat in second place, so I didn't really put much effort into practicing this game, compared to what I should have done, if I'm honest. Even after Malice's advice, I got cocky. You little shit. When looking at Torna, there are two main versions of any percent. Glitched and glitchless, with the former being my category of choice. The checkpoint system of all Xenoblade games mean we can't exactly skip to the final boss, but this does change up the route a lot. When you're playing Xenoblade 2 or Torna, if you hold down all four shoulder buttons, X and down on the D-pad for five seconds, this happens. Damn it! And people said this game was bad. As you can imagine, this isn't usually helpful, but if we can do this in a campsite with correct timing, we can put our blades into this death state, and you can then walk around freely if you swapped one of your other characters. Do this with both Jin and Haze, and both your blades are in the zombie state. This status is pretty glitchy, allowing things like swaps in midair, impossible normally. For a very short duration after the swap, we can also jump with our other character. By doing this over and over again, we start to fly. But like I say, it's glitchy. Just as these quirks can lift us up into the air, they can also make us come crashing down again, which happened in this run, meaning the brutal time loss came early on, like in Definitive Edition. 
but unlike the final boss, like in Future Connected or Base 2, probably. But eventually, we can use this height to get to the Soaring Rostrum, the landmark right before the final boss gauntlet, as well as jumping down to Hyber Village, because this glitch also lets us survive any fool. For our final use of glitches here, we also clip into the Tasteless Altar, where the Nop on Half Sage will tell you about the post-game bosses, and can open the chests for accessories and weapon chips. We collect the gold and silver chips, which basically make every encounter at the start of the game a joke. Whilst a lot of the combat is straightforward, Torna still requires a lot of concentration due to the community system. As the story of Torna isn't very long on its own, we have to complete a bunch of side quests in order to progress. Whether this is a good mechanic or not is not important for this video. All that matters is getting it done here quickly. Since many community members are spread out across a wide area, you need to stay on top of warping to all these pretty unconnected areas back to back, which is pretty manageable when you're confident in the route, but this was my second run of the category in about 6 months. The other important part is collectibles. We need items in Torna. A lot of them. In Xenoblade 1, we've gotten all our stuff by Chapter 1, and in Xenoblade 2 by Chapter 3, but in this game we're still collecting way past the halfway point. Each collectible is needed in a different amount for a different quest at a different time in the run, and you need to keep track of all of this in your head. In theory, someone like me who has a lot of time in the game should be able to keep track of this, but it was beginning to pass midnight and I had just spent the last 11 hours speedrunning Xenoblade. My mind was getting pretty fried. In theory, the final boss of Torna would be this dude, Gort. <laughs> but you literally cannot die in this fight, so in the eyes of many, the final boss is Malos, with Gort basically just being a little victory lap. The final phase of Malos relies on us getting a break, which we can convert into a topple and get a big chain attack from there. I had a really good opportunity, but a slight slip up eventually snowballed into Hugo falling, and then more characters fell. I was able to prevent a full party wipe, but still lost a few minutes trying to recover this fight. Eventually I won, and was able to finish out my Torna run with a 2.25.22. Now moving on to the longest game in this challenge, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. It was roughly 2am, I had been speedrunning for practically 12 hours straight, and yet it was now time for the longest run so far. Just like in 2, I was doing the any percent normal DLC category for this game. Even though the DLC isn't as impactful here, it just makes the run feel nicer and more consistent to play, along with the fact I was going to use the DLC to finish this run off anyway. I'd argue this is probably the hardest run in the series, with some of the most precise strategies only made harder by the fact we have to juggle playing as all 6 characters. However, the main enemy for me here was my desire to go to sleep. By this point in the run I was exhausted, but I knew I had to lock in for just these last two games. In between games I was making sure to take some breaks, but that still isn't quite enough and I had to use some uh, inventive techniques so I didn't fall asleep in my chair. If you're tackling a long run like this, I highly recommend making sure you stay at least a little bit active, and of course, have food and drinks to keep yourself full of beans. That goes for if you're watching a long video as well, so make sure you remain hydrated and stretch your legs, alright? Xenoblade 3 has some of the bulkiest bosses in the series, but this is balanced out by also having the most powerful chain attacks. Take the fight against Doric, or the incomplete siege lab in Chapter 3 for example. Even with just a single level advantage over us, this boss will pack a punch, and so we aim to keep the aggro away from our four attackers by using a player controlled Neo who will evade through his nastier starts. Keeping us up will take about 40% of his health away, and then it becomes time to use a chain attack to get rid of the rest. Even though this party is built for dealing damage, we still need some last minute preparation before jumping straight into the chain. The first of which is to get everyone bunched together so that I can use a power ring with Tyon and give a damage buff to as many people as possible. The next is to use the Arc Glorious Wing as the Noah or Boris, which gives a power charge to everyone, a buff that significantly increases the damage of the next dart used. However, this is where a fatal mistake was about to happen. As I was in the art animation, Doric used the art Heat Injection, which would have killed multiple party members because not only is it very powerful, it's also AoE. In my panic, I started the chain a split second too early, meaning I couldn't get the buffs off but I kept everyone on 1 HP, 
meaning delaying would have been risky. This hurt the damage so much that I couldn't even kill in the chain, and was forced to retry the fight. But to add salt to the wound, my second attempt saw both healers fall. On the third attempt, I was finally able to break through, showing the strength of Xenoblade 3's chain attacks in optimal conditions, however, not without seeing an 8 minute time loss in the process. When they work, the chain attacks can provide incredible results, but you need to be very precise with your buffs and positioning, on top of sometimes even needing to get some good RNG. When you're going for a full chain with 3 characters and a hero, there is an 11% chance you fail, which are low odds, but also very punishing on these unlucky runs. Thankfully, through lots of clever routing, a lot of this RNG is taken out through getting the Ouroboros level to 3 and chaining from there, or by killing off Mio and going straight into the chain. Doing this is called Early Chapter 5, by the way, because, uh, yeah. This works because there are less characters for the game to choose from, therefore giving you the ones you want more frequently. Speaking of Chapter 5, by the time I'd gotten there, I wasn't feeling any less tired, and had resorted to putting on some fast-paced music in order to keep myself awake. This is because the first half of this chapter is very slow-paced, since we need to take some detours in order to power ourselves up for the rest of the run. This involves a trip down to the deepest part of Algara's depths, where by sneaking around a unique monster, we find ourselves a chaperone in a chest. Now, this item is quite a bit more complex than the standard Increase X Stat accessory, and will instead influence the whole way you approach fights. Every time you use a unique art in quick succession after using another art, the damage multiplier of that next art is increased, so by the time we've done 5 different arts in a row, the 6th will be incredibly powerful. But whilst there are many strong arts in this game, which one do we choose to make as strong as possible with the Shackering? Final Lucky 7, it's obviously Final Lucky 7. Once we reach Chapter 6, Noel gets access to a new talent arc called Unlimited Sword, that will temporarily turn him into a new, very balanced class, with the talent art of this class being called Final Lucky 7. This art will do the entire break, topple, launch, smash combo on any enemies in range. By using all five arts into this talent art, we can cause damage like this. Which is insane when combined with how much you can spam those arts, and the fact that Lucky 7 has inbuilt doom. Granted, this doesn't make the ending of the run easy, especially going through Origin, as you can very quickly spiral into massive amounts of time loss, even before we reach the final boss, Zed. This is the longest battle in the series by a wide margin, and if you wanted to be a nerd about it, this fight has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 phases, which I will not be explaining in detail today at least. If we take a death in this fight, we're sent back to the start, giving us a time loss of over 20 minutes. But if you play it safe, you shouldn't be dying unless something goes seriously wrong. Here I played it pretty well, and finished XC3 with a 7 11 23. This was pretty far off PB, but with my levels of tiredness, alongside the length and difficulty of the run, this was a pretty acceptable time for me. One more to go. Five games into the run, I hadn't even come close to a personal best. But the last game left was Future Redeemed, by far the weakest of all of my times. Now with a fresh burst of energy knowing I was two hours away from the grand finale, I started off the run strong with my best ever chapter one time. Could this be the ending we were looking for? Perhaps not. A new way of gaining XP introduced in Future Redeemed was the combat streak, where for every enemy defeated in battle, you get even more XP for defeating the next. This can lead to some pretty crazy increases in experience, so it can help tremendously when you consider how much of the game's content we skip. At the start of Chapter 4, we're pitted against Nael, but rather than go straight into our boss fight, we instead quit out and start taking down monsters to the side. After we've gotten through a bunch of them, we'll run in and start our fight for real. This strat is very cool, but it has its downsides. First of all, it's very easy to see both your healers take a death. Retry the fight. Once you've gotten through all that, Nael has very high break resist, which can lose tons of time or even lead to a wipe. Retry the fight. And even if we manage to start a chain attack, we might not see Rex and Glimmer at the right times, meaning we won't get enough damage to kill. Retry the fight. 
Every retry means we have to start fighting the enemies from scratch, so if we lose it in the chain, you're losing multiple minutes. Compared to base Xenoblade like 3, you're more likely to lose it in the chain as well. Since there's no hero in FR, the chance of getting the chain you want goes down from 89% to only 75%, meaning lost runs to not L are very common. This chain attack RNG also makes the end game very brutal, with us needing another unity pairing of Rex and Glimmer to get the kill on N, on top of two brutal skips in the Black Mountains, Turkin and Igna skip. However, nothing is more brutal than the very final boss of the series, Alpha. On top of having high break resistance and a lot of powerful arts to melt for our party members, we are also cursed with a new teammate, Nael. Nael is treated like a hero character from the base game. You can't control her, she contributes with her own damage, and shows up in chain attacks. However, she still uses up a charge of the chain attack in this game, unlike in base 3 where the hero will keep the chain frozen. This means that there is a greater likelihood to see characters in chains who we're not looking for, meaning the chance of getting the characters we need in the third round goes from 75% to just 60%. Eventually though, I saw both Rex and Glimmer in the chain order, and was able to deliver the finishing blow, finishing the first ever completion of the series speedrun in 22 hours, 19 minutes and 55 seconds, a de facto world record, and smashing the subday barrier. Wait, is this, is this 19? Is this 19? Yeah it is, yeah it is, jolly. That's a long speedrun. That's a very long speedrun. <laughs> well, after completing a long speedrun like this, it begs the question, what's next? In terms of Xenoblade, I'd love to get the world record back in Xenoblade 2, a sub 630 in Xenoblade 3, and a sub 150 in Future Redeemed primarily, but PVs in the other games will be cool as well. Also, some may be wondering where Xenoblade X was in all of this. I gotta admit, I've never actually finished that game even casually, but maybe if there's a sequel I'll have to finish those games and do their speedruns. And finally, there is the question of will I run it again, and well, yeah. This is my favourite series ever, and these runs are some of my favourites as well. Even if they have elements that frustrate me, I could even see myself bringing the time down to below 21 hours. Even in spite of its many flaws, the effort I put into learning all of the games in the series and the difficulty of finishing a run this long still makes this one of my proudest speedruns. Thanks for watching.